Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named 13 Terrors Part 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled Follow to Death, begins with a high schooler, Im, sitting in the dark, crying and repeatedly calling her best friend Jen, but she couldn't get through. Finally, she sent a text message asking Jen to come over because she couldn't take it anymore. Meanwhile, Jen was returning from a camping trip sitting in a taxi with a dead phone. She had borrowed the car charger to power on her phone and saw 33 missed calls from Im. She tried calling back, but no one answered. Worried, Jen hurried to Im's house. When she rang the doorbell, she saw Im standing by her window, staring and not responding to a wave. The sight was terrifying, and she soon disappeared from view. Entering the house, Jen was puzzled. The entire family was dressed in black, and Im's father was comforting her crying grandmother. In the picture frame was a black and white photo of Im. Growing more uneasy, Jen excused herself to the bathroom to check her phone again. Im had definitely sent her a message earlier. Confused, Jen walked out of the bathroom and saw Im standing right in front of her. Frightened, she ordered her friend to stay away. Im led Jen to her messy bedroom, where her own memorial portrait was displayed on the desk. Im explained that her mother had placed it there to ward off evil spirits. If anyone came to take her away, they would think she was already dead upon seeing the portrait. Jen asked why everyone in the house was wearing black and why her grandmother was crying. After a pause, Im revealed that her grandmother's best friend had died and she was mourning in black attire. Jen placed the memorial portrait back and she noticed a half-open drawer. As she reached to grab a notebook, Im quickly took it from her, looking terrified. She said her boyfriend was looking for her and wanted her to be with him. She then broke down in tears and clung to Jen. A few days earlier, Imin had happily told Jen on a video call that she had broken up with her boyfriend, Ball. However, shortly after, Ball showed up at Im's house, knocking on her door. He didn't want to break up, but Im was determined. No matter how much Ball pleaded outside her door, she resolutely closed it on him. She didn't answer his calls either, so Ball left in frustration. Im's mother urged her to talk things through with Ball, but Im dismissed her concerns. Ball was persistent and continued to contact Im online, but she had made up her mind. Frustrated with his clinginess, she told him if he wanted to die, then he should just do it and they could be together as ghosts. Im didn't want to deal with him anymore and closed her laptop, feeling annoyed. One evening, Im was happily chatting with a boy online when she suddenly received a message from Ball. To her horror, it was a photo of him with a rope around his neck. Afraid, she immediately called him, but he didn't answer. The next morning, she saw Ball had sent her last night a photo of a pair of feet dangling in midair. Panicked, she texted him, pleading with him to stop and saying she was scared. Just then, a call came in from Ball's phone, but it wasn't him. The caller claimed to be from a hospital and said that the phone's owner had attempted to kill himself by hanging the night before. They wanted to notify the family to come to the hospital, and was petrified. Back in the present, Im confided in Jen that she felt Ball had never left and seemed to be around her. Suddenly, there was a frantic knocking at the door. The two girls exchanged glances, holding their breath. Thankfully, it was Im's mother. She said Im's grandmother was going to attend a friend's funeral the next day and wanted Im to join her. However, Im didn't want to go. Seeing the situation, Jen volunteered to stay with Im. So Jen stepped out of the room to tell her mother she wouldn't be coming home that night. When Jen returned, Im was crying again, saying she couldn't take it anymore and felt like she was going crazy. Jen comforted her best friend. In the middle of the night, Im woke up and noticed that her laptop was on. Fearing it might be damaged, she wanted to wake the sleeping Jen, but instead she touched a rope. To her horror, the other end was looped around Jen's neck. She thought Ball had come to take revenge and shuddered at the thought, but she still mustered the courage to approach the computer. An hour-old message from Ball awaited her. She clicked on it and saw an emoji of two people together. Im was in a state of panic. Suddenly, Ball sent another call request, but she didn't dare to accept it. Then Ball texted her, be with me. She was on the verge of a breakdown. Ball sent her a video, reminding her of their 10-year relationship, how she had been his everything, and how they had sworn to be together forever. But Im had abandoned him. Frightened, Im kept apologizing to her boyfriend in the video, begging Ball not to scare her anymore. Ball replied that she said if he died, she'd be with him again, so he would be waiting for her. Then, Ball hanged himself, struggling for a moment before going still. In the morning, Jen was awakened by crying. To her shock, Im had hanged herself out of guilt. Im's mother was on the floor, crying her heart out. When Jen realized what had happened, she too burst into tears. After the funeral home staff carried Im's body away, Ball called again. 
Jen answered the video call and yelled at Ball, saying it's all his fault that Im is dead. It turned out that Ball's death was a cruel prank he had orchestrated because he couldn't accept that Im had moved on. In his anger, Ball sought revenge and enlisted Jen's help. Jen didn't want to betray her friend, but Ball assured her he only wanted Im to realize her mistake. So Jen followed Ball's plan, pretending to be a hospital staff member calling Im and bringing the rope Ball provided to Im's house. When she had stepped out to call her mother, she was actually talking to Ball. She told him that Im had realized her mistake and begged him to stop scaring her. But Ball insisted on seeing it through. Jen had secretly opened Im's laptop and put the rope around her own neck to scare Im. However, neither she nor Ball could have imagined the tragic outcome. As Jen was at a loss for what to do, Im called her. Soon, the ghostly figure of Im appeared on the screen, strangling Ball. Not long after, the news of Im and Ball's death spread online. The dead Im and Ball kept calling Jen, beckoning her to join them on the journey to hell. Petrified, Jen imitated Im's previous actions, carrying the memorial portrait to school every day, hoping the portrait would accompany and protect her. The second story, titled Vanita, begins with a gentle girl named Mana, who had a strong interest in supernatural things. One day after class, her classmate Korn secretly led her to a big tree on campus. Comparing the tree to an old photograph on her phone, Korn excitedly pointed out that they had found the original spot shown in the photo. Indeed, the tree in the picture looked similar to the one before them. The two girls couldn't contain their excitement and ran to pose for goofy pictures with the tree. In their spare time, Mana and Korn loved nothing more than collecting ghost stories that took place at their school. When they learned that their school grounds used to be a site for executions, they were overjoyed. As they were about to leave school, Korn realized she had left her English book in the classroom. She asked Mana to wait for her while she hurried back to fetch it. Even while waiting for her friend, Mana didn't forget to take pictures with the old building behind her. That night, after finishing their homework together at Mana's house, the two girls went online to search for more ghost stories about their school. They came across a rumor about a girl named Vernida, who had been decapitated by a school custodian, but her head had never been found. It was said that if someone discovered the girl's head in their desk, they had to find it within two days, or they would be cursed to die and become a sacrificial ghost. Upon hearing this, Korn's expression changed. She told Mana that when she went back to the classroom alone that afternoon, she heard strange noises and approached a shaking desk. Just as she was about to reveal more, Mana's mother entered the room, interrupting their conversation. It was getting late, so Korn put on her helmet and rode her scooter back home. The next day, Korn didn't come to school. During math class, Mana felt her desk being nudged forward several times. Finally fed up, she turned around to confront the perpetrator, only to find there was no one there. After class, the teacher asked Mana about Korn's whereabouts. Mana replied that she had called her, but Korn had not answered. After the teacher left, Mana managed to reach Korn on the phone. Korn explained that she had overslept after taking pain medication and had missed school. Relieved, Mana hung up the phone. However, just as she bent down to pick up her pen, she discovered a girl's head inside her desk, which abruptly opened its eyes. Terrified, Mana screamed in a chicken voice and squatted down on the floor, completely losing her composure. Afterwards, Mana went to the edge of a water basin and splashed cold water on her face, reflecting on the incredible scene she had just witnessed. However, when her classmates came over to help her up, the head had disappeared. Korn had sent a message asking her to call, so Mana dialed her number once more. At that moment, the mirror behind her suddenly shattered, and Korn's mother's voice came through the phone. Before class, the teacher announced Korn had been in a car accident the previous night. Her scooter collided with a car, and because she hadn't worn a helmet, her head was severed from her body. The scene was horrifying. Upon hearing this news, Mana was devastated. She couldn't help but think of the curse involving the severed head, feeling uneasy that she might be cursed to be the next. After school, she returned to the classroom and frantically searched through her classmates' desks. Just as she approached a suspicious-looking desk, a hand suddenly tapped her shoulder. It was the teacher, looking angry and confused as to why Mana would be rummaging through others' desks. Under the teacher's relentless questioning, Mana finally spoke up. She asked if there had ever been a girl named Vanida at the school. The teacher was taken aback, but eventually admitted the truth. He added that he didn't believe in the rumors circulating online and comforted Mana, telling her not to let her imagination run wild. That night, Mana's mother came to her room to console her, saying that no matter what was bothering her, she could always talk to her mother instead of bottling it up. However, Mana felt that even if she told her mother, she might not believe her. 
At that moment, her mother suddenly noticed a trickle of blood on Mana's neck, which puzzled both of them. That night, Mana had a terrifying dream. Her teacher asked her to solve a math problem, but when she turned around after reaching the board, the classroom was empty. Then, a headless girl appeared and wrote, Help me, on the board. Mana woke up in a cold sweat. Feeling that the dream was rather strange, she went online to research Vanita's story again. She believed that Vanita must want her to do something for her. Mana thought of a method to summon the ghost, Vanita. She prepared some necessities for the summoning ritual and put them in her bag. That night, she sneaked back to the school. Mana spread a sheet of paper with the alphabet written on it across the table and lit an incense stick. She first burned the incense in a cup for a while, then placed the cup upside down on the paper. With her finger supporting the bottom of the cup, she chanted an incantation. At that moment, a ghostly hand also touched the cup, responding to her questions. The ghost identified itself as Vanita and asked Mana to help her find her missing head. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind blew, and Mana saw two girls and a boy enter the dark classroom. They sat cross-legged on the floor and began playing the Ghost in the Cup game. Mana glanced at the blackboard and saw the date, May 26, 2000. From the photos she had seen online, she recognized one of the girls as Vernita. Mana tried to call out to her, but Vernita seemed not to notice. It turned out they were not in the same time frame. The three of them asked several questions, but the ghost would only reveal that it was a deceased criminal without giving any details about its identity or how long it had been dead. Finally, they asked Vanita what it needed help with, but the ghost repeatedly spelled out the word death on the paper, unable to stop. At that moment, the school's caretaker interrupted the ritual. He walked into the classroom holding a flashlight, and the cup suddenly stopped moving. The old caretaker scolded them and told them to leave immediately. However, when Venita stood up to collect her things, the cup fell to the floor and shattered. The caretaker came over after hearing the noise, warning Venita to be careful of the glass shards. Suddenly, he fainted and began convulsing on the floor. After a while, he stood up, reached into his pocket, and pulled out a switchblade. He touched the blade and held it up, waving it menacingly. Venita asked if he was all right, but then something terrible happened. The caretaker turned around and glared at Venita, raising the knife and stabbing it toward her neck. The other two ran out of the classroom in fear. Terrified, Mana collapsed on the floor. The caretaker used the knife to cut Vanita, eventually severing her head. He then walked out of the classroom carrying Vanita's head. At that moment, the headless corpse on the floor got up and gestured for Mana to follow. Mana mustered the strength to step outside the classroom. She watched as the caretaker carried the head down the stairs. She hurriedly followed, stumbling and falling once, and saw the caretaker enter a room. In reality, the door to that room was locked. She spotted an iron shovel, picked it up and broke the lock within a few swings. Mana pulled up the rolling door and went inside. This was an abandoned warehouse used for storing desks and chairs. The light had long since failed, so she used her phone to illuminate the space. She walked straight to a table, removed an overturned chair on top, and, as expected, saw a wrapped skull. It seemed as if a force was resisting her, and it took Mana a great deal of effort to retrieve the skull. Feeling deep sympathy for the deceased girl, she held the darkened skull in her arms, clasped her hands together, and recited a prayer. At that moment, the skull began to sob. A burly man wielding a knife appeared behind Mana, and the skull cried out in fear. As she cried, Mana recited the prayer more forcefully. Just as the knife was about to strike her, the ghostly figure and the crying sounds disappeared. Knowing how Vanita was killed in the past through the visions, Mana brought Vanita's head to the large tree, lit an incense stick, and buried the head with soil, which she hoped could end the curse. Exhausted, she returned home to find her parents anxiously waiting for her. Crying, Mana embraced her mother and said it felt good to be home. She told her mom she hadn't done anything wrong, and her mom nodded in agreement. Suddenly, her mom asked if she had brought a friend home. Mana and her father looked towards the door but saw nothing. Unexpectedly, the cup Mana had brought home rolled to the floor and shattered. Sensing trouble, Mana saw her mother collapse to the ground. Her father rushed over, but it was too late. Just as the caretaker had been possessed by the ghost, her mother was now possessed and stabbed her husband. With a blank stare, she raised the knife and chased after her daughter. The possessed mother trapped Mana's head with a chair and swung the knife towards her. In the classroom, Vanita approached a desk with her head fully reattached. She thanked the head of Mana inside the desk. Soon, Mana's head began to distort. Vanita had asked for help finding her head, but she really wanted someone to take her place. Mana had lost her life because of her kindness. 
The third story, titled Curse, begins with a shy high school student named Get, who arrived at the park as planned one morning, but his friends hadn't arrived yet. So Get called his friend Aim, but was redirected to her voicemail. With no other choice, he decided to take a nap on a stone bench. An hour later, his friend Joe finally arrived. After chatting for a bit, Aim also showed up. It was clear from their interactions that Get had a secret crush on Aim, but the oblivious Aim had no idea, and she seemed closer to Joe. Actually, they were there to complete a computer class assignment, which involved shooting a video at the park. Get and Aim quickly got to work and began filming. Joe, on the other hand, appeared nonchalant, even using the tripod to poke at Get. This annoyed Get, but Joe continued to escalate his antics. The filming was interrupted, and Get expressed his concern that they might not finish the shoot that day. At this point, Joe suggested making a music video. Get didn't express his opinion, but seeing the look of anticipation on Aim's face, he agreed. Joe held the DV camera, following some old people doing old exercise while filming. Aim's gaze stayed on Joe, her eyes filled with admiration. Meanwhile, Get was so infatuated with Aim that he didn't hear Joe call him twice, only responding when Joe shouted his nickname, Diarrhea Rush. During their break, Aim asked about the origin of Get's nickname. Joe was about to launch into the story when Get quickly slapped Joe's shoulder, signaling him not to say anything. Get didn't want his embarrassing past to be known by his crush. However, Joe agreed not to say anything, but began recounting the story in vivid detail. When Get was in elementary school, a classmate pranked on him, causing him to have a diarrhea rush. Now that his beloved AIM knew about this humiliating incident, Get was so angry he wanted to leave immediately. Joe began to apologize, but his apology lacked sincerity, and he even tried to hold Get back by grabbing his arm. Annoyed, Get shoved Joe, who happened to be near someone riding a bicycle. While dodging the bike, Joe twisted his ankle and sat down under a tree. The camera slipped from his hand and fell to the ground. Joe grabbed something nearby and threw it at Get. The two boys began to argue. AIM told Get to apologize to Joe, but Get refused, believing that it wasn't intentional and Joe was the one in the wrong. Get didn't want to lose face by apologizing to Joe in front of the girl he liked. Seeing this, Joe started hurling insults, saying that he cursed Get to be hit by a car and die. This scene was accidentally captured by the fallen camera. In the evening, after arriving home, Joe felt troubled. He received a message from Get saying that the video had been sent over. However, it needed some editing, and Get would show it to him on Monday morning. Perhaps out of spite, Joe called AIM to tell her that he didn't plan on using Get's edited version. Instead, he wanted to edit the video himself and submit it on Monday. On Monday, during computer class, Get hadn't shown up yet. As the assignment presentation time approached, Joe sent a message to Get, asking if he was coming. There was no response from Get. Thus, Joe and AIM went up to the podium, preparing to present the video that Joe had edited. At that moment, their teacher's phone rang. As she stepped out to answer the call, Joe sent another message to Get, saying that if he doesn't come now, they'll present the version he edited himself. This time, Get's reply arrived quickly. However, only their teacher returned and announced that Get had been involved in a car accident on his way to school that morning and had died on the spot. Joe became scared. If Get was dead, who had replied to his message? The teacher dismissed the class early. As the students prepared to leave, the video began playing automatically. Joe and AIM exchanged puzzled glances, unable to understand what was going on. The video suddenly switched to the scene where Joe cursed Get to be hit by a car, and everyone's eyes turned to Joe. In the evening, the classmates attended Get's funeral at a temple. They whispered among themselves, discussing whether Joe realized he had done something wrong by cursing Get to die. Only AIM stood by Joe, comforting him. Suddenly, Joe's phone rang and he stepped outside to answer it. However, when he checked, there was no call. Instead, he received a black and white photo of Get. Joe was terrified, but no one else was around. He looked back at the temple and realized that the photo he had received was Get's memorial portrait. At that moment, he received another message from Get, dead. Joe became increasingly uneasy. After the funeral, AIM comforted him on the way home, telling him not to overthink things and he could tell Get to come find her and she would take his place. They parted ways and went back to their respective homes. As AIM reached her front door and began searching for her keys, she heard a strange noise. She looked around but saw no one. Frantically rummaging through her bag for the keys, she dropped them due to her nervousness. As she bent down to pick them up, a hand-shaped shadow suddenly appeared. She quickly grabbed the keys but couldn't unlock the door. Then, footsteps approached from a distance, and a dark figure loomed over her. Aim screamed in terror. 
That evening, Joe asked his mother if cursing someone to die could actually cause their death. She told him not to curse others, as those who did could face an even worse fate. Joe became even more frightened. The next morning, Joe went to the temple and asked a monk to perform a ritual for Get's soul. He apologized to Get for any wrongs he had committed and pleaded for forgiveness. After leaving the temple, Joe returned to the classroom but didn't see AIM. A male student confronted him, accusing him of changing Get's Facebook profile picture to the one from his memorial portrait. Joe, terrified, collapsed on the floor and insisted he would never do such a thing. But no one believed him. Just then, AIM's mother called to say that AIM was in the hospital. She had found her daughter lying outside their house the previous night and had rushed her to the hospital. Thankfully, AIM wasn't seriously injured, but still unconscious from the shock. After hanging up, Joe went back to the computer lab for class. The teacher was discussing the details for the next day's field trip. He logged onto Facebook to check Get's profile picture and saw that it had indeed been changed to his memorial portrait. Suddenly, Joe received a message from Get that read Beware, followed by three death-related characters. Students around him also began shouting, Dead! Joe jumped in alarm. Suddenly, the scene of Joe cursing Get played on the classroom's screen, and the same footage appeared on every student's computer. Joe's phone was flooded with death-related messages from Get. That night, after returning home, Joe received a message from a classmate saying that the afternoon's incident was caused by a computer glitch and had nothing to do with him. They reminded Joe not to be late for the 7 a.m. departure for the field trip the next day. At that moment, Joe received another message from Get. Terrified, he threw his phone away. An unknown force kept tugging at his bedroom door. Scared, Joe curled up in his blanket, shouting and asking who was outside. After a while, his mother's voice replied that it was her. Suspicious, Joe got out of bed and opened the door, but no one was there. The door slammed shut and Get's shadow appeared, frightening Joe back onto his bed. He repeatedly apologized to Get, saying he didn't mean it and asked him not to come after him anymore. He admitted that cursing Get was wrong and that he was just joking. He never knew it would turn out like this. The room gradually fell silent, and just when Joe thought he was safe, Get's head suddenly fell from the sky. Joe fainted from sheer terror. The next day, Joe woke up in a hospital bed. Just as he thought Get had come back for revenge, AIM grasped his hand. She then showed Joe her phone, saying that Get won't scare them anymore. It displayed news of a traffic accident involving the bus their class was supposed to take on a field trip. The bus had overturned not long after leaving school, but fortunately, no students were aboard. Only the driver had died. It turned out that Get had sensed the impending accident and, with great effort, frightened all the students into the hospital to protect them. He had been silently watching over his friends, reminding them in his own way. The fourth story, titled Pusam, begins with a mother who was a well-known psychic. She made her living by helping others with their troubles. Although her daughter Juan knew that her parents were simply deceiving people with their tricks and that their loyal followers were actually paid accomplices, she still willingly accepted this way of life, even helping her parents attract business on the side. Together, they deceived patients with complicated illnesses, becoming accomplices to the fraud. The magical tools they used were actually handcrafted by her parents. For example, the blood seeping from the knife blade was injected into the handle beforehand using a syringe. The miraculous potions they sold were made from painkillers and other random ingredients. Since Juan's mother claimed to be possessed by the great god Pusam, Juan was naturally seen by her classmates as having supernatural abilities as well. Students would come to her for fortune-telling or to buy medicine. One day after school, her classmate Cherry stopped her. Cherry wasn't diligent in her studies and led a carefree lifestyle, making her susceptible to being deceived by boys. She told Juan that she had been experiencing stomach pain and asked for her help. Juan knew another business opportunity had come her way. She secretly recorded the conversation, recalling that she had seen Cherry arguing with her boyfriend and knew she had recently had an abortion. So she told her that she must be haunted by a little ghost. As expected, Cherry also thought she was being haunted by an infant spirit. Juan told her to come to her house the next day so her mother could help her. When Juan returned home, she told her mother about Cherry's situation and disclosed all the details. The next day, Cherry arrived as promised, accompanied by a close friend. Juan's psychic mother took an egg, which had been filled with hair beforehand, and rolled it on Cherry's stomach. She then cracked the egg open, picked out the hair, and showed it to Cherry, saying that she was haunted by a little ghost because she took away its life. Now it wants her to die. Cherry was terrified and asked the great Pusam for help. 
The psychic mother told her to do good deeds and accumulate enough virtue to send it away, and also asked her to take this medicine so the little ghost won't harm her. She then handed Cherry a bottle of homemade magical potion, saying, This potion has been blessed by her psychic powers, and it can cure all ailments. Seeing Cherry's hesitation, the psychic mother continued to scare her that this vicious ghost wants her to die. If she did as instructed, she would be healed within a week. Cherry believed her and took the medicine. However, after that, Cherry seemed to become even sicker. She came to school less and less, and her classmates said her condition was worsening. Rumors even spread that she had contracted AIDS. One day, Cherry came to Juan's house again for treatment. The psychic mother continued to pretend to be possessed by the great Pu Sam, using a small stick to beat Cherry while chanting. She then raised a ceremonial knife, waving it wildly behind Cherry before slashing at her back. She then pressed lit incense sticks against Cherry's back, torturing her mercilessly. Cherry wailed in pain, and Juan couldn't bear to watch, turning away. That evening, Juan's mother was counting money again. Juan asked if what they did to Cherry was too much, but her mother dismissed her concerns, saying this was a way to gain her trust and her friend would get better on her own. However, Juan felt it wasn't that simple. Indeed, Cherry's condition only worsened. Yet her mother insisted that Cherry's condition wasn't as severe as she claimed and that all they needed to do was reassure her. Once she felt better, her condition would naturally improve and she would come to thank them. One day, as Juan was about to reach home, Cherry stopped her on the street. Cherry asked why she hadn't gotten better after following Pusam's instructions, but had instead gotten worse. Juan tried to find an excuse to leave, but Cherry grabbed her arm and sincerely asked her not to lie to her since they were friends. After hesitating, Juan told Cherry she would recover and to endure a little longer. Cherry believed her, but her condition continued to deteriorate. The next time Juan saw Cherry at school, she looked like a withered shell, barely able to stand. Juan's emotions were complex. During class, a scream from a female student came from outside the classroom. Everyone rushed out to find Cherry lying in pain on the floor, her eyes bloodshot and her fingers digging into the ground. Soon, Cherry stopped struggling and died. After school, Juan walked home with a heavy heart, feeling as if someone was behind her. But when she turned around, there was nothing. She didn't see that it was Cherry's ghost. As she reached her front door, she heard a commotion. Cherry's parents had come to confront the psychic. The psychic mother quickly pretended to be possessed by Cherry, soothing her parents' emotions and convincing them to leave. However, Cherry's best friend seemed off. She suddenly grabbed Juan's neck and yelled that she was going to kill her for lying to her parents. Fortunately, the two were quickly separated. In the evening, the psychic mother examined the marks on her daughter's neck, comforting her not to overthink the situation. Cherry's best friend was just too heartbroken, which led her to act out like that. However, Juan believed that it was Cherry's ghost. Her mother didn't believe in the existence of ghosts, and told her that as long as she believed there were no ghosts in the world, she wouldn't encounter any. The next day, the female classmate brought her boyfriend to school, hoping Juan could help read their fortune. At that moment, the deceased Cherry suddenly appeared. Juan was shocked and hurried to the bathroom to wash her face. Startled, she closed her eyes and repeated to herself that there were no ghosts. But when she opened her eyes, she could still see Cherry standing in front of her, blood pouring from her mouth. Juan nervously returned to the classroom for class, with Cherry's ghost following her, standing in the corner. Juan screamed in fear, and the teacher and classmates came to comfort her. To her, Cherry's ghost was everywhere. In order to protect herself, she picked up a pair of scissors. The school later called Juan's parents to inform them that she had stabbed the teacher's arm with the scissors. The male teacher escorted the emotionally distraught Juan home, where her parents were already prepared to greet her. Her mother ordered her followers to pin Juan to the ground to exorcise her. Juan wailed that she was not possessed by a ghost, but had actually encountered one. However, her mother didn't listen. As the exorcism was taking place, Juan saw Cherry's ghost appear in the corner, staring at her angrily. No matter how much she cried out, her mother ignored her. She picked up a stick and hit her daughter hard. The father reminded his wife that it was enough, but she didn't seem to hear him. It wasn't until Juan shouted that she's gone that her mother finally stopped. Just when everyone thought the ritual was over, the mother ordered someone to bring incense sticks. She took a knife and slashed at her daughter's back. The father was shocked as the daughter's clothes were torn and blood seeped out. This was taking the act too far. Then, the mother pressed the scorching hot incense sticks against her daughter's back. That night, the mother gently combed her daughter's hair and apologized. Juan was understanding, knowing her mother acted that way to make others believe in her divine power. But she still had some doubts. She asked her mother if everything was normal during the afternoon ritual.
The mother gave a bitter smile and urged her daughter not to overthink it. As she handed medicine to Juan, she watched as her daughter took the medicine and held her in her arms. But at that moment, Juan realized that her mother had just given her the same hair-soaked potion. Then, she saw Cherry's ghost again in the corner. The ghost mimicked her mother's voice, reassuring her that there's no such thing as ghosts. The mother, seemingly possessed by the ghost, tightened her hands around Juan's neck, indicating her tragic end. The fifth story, titled Scare Beautiful, begins with a teenager, An, who was a popular young man admired by many girls. After playing a game of basketball, female fans lined up to offer him food and drinks. As they swooned over him, a girl handed him a cup of red beverage. He took a sip and thought it tasted a bit strange. Since his English grades were poor, On decided to attend a tutoring class after playing basketball. However, he couldn't concentrate. Then a cute girl walked by the window, instantly energizing him. He left the classroom to follow her, only to bump into her by chance. On was smitten at first sight. After class, he secretly waited in the hallway for her to finish her lesson, hoping to strike up a conversation. At the bus stop, he moved closer to the girl, but just as he was about to speak, the bus arrived. He decided to get on the bus as well. He continued to follow her, eventually arriving at her apartment door. It was a two-story building in an isolated area with no lights, even though it wasn't late. Feeling a bit nervous, On prepared to leave, but was startled when the girl suddenly appeared, asking why he had followed her all the way home. On, a seasoned charmer, quickly made an excuse that he wanted to protect her. His smooth words appeased the girl, who didn't seem to mind On. She told him her name was Fun, and that's how they became acquainted. The next day, On arrived early at the tutoring center, waiting for the girl to show up. As soon as she entered, he followed her inside, found the classroom where she was studying, and sat down next to her. He then playfully asked Fun to help him with his homework. Unable to resist, she agreed. She then handed him a bottle of red drink. Lately, he had been feeling that his taste buds were off. Every sweet beverage he tried tasted strange. After the tutoring session, he walked Fun home like a pet dog and asked for her help with his studies that very day. Upon entering, he was suddenly confronted by a woman with a disfigured face. Fun introduced her as their housemaid, not her mother. The old house seemed eerie and frightening at night, with geckos visiting and strange things around. Taking advantage of the moment when Fun went upstairs to change clothes, On inspected the house. It was indeed unusual. The lighting was dim, and many Gumantong statues were displayed on the cabinets. There were also red talismans on the walls. After changing clothes, Fun came downstairs and began tutoring On in English. However, his mind was not on studying. His eyes kept focusing on her body like a camera. At that moment, the housemaid brought him a red drink. As On tried to excuse himself, he heard a woman's crying coming from a room. He hesitated, wanting to pull the door open and peek inside, but his wrist was grabbed by the housemaid. He was startled. Although On felt a bit uneasy with the allure of beauty before him, he shamelessly chose to stay overnight. On was arranged to sleep on the sofa downstairs, but he didn't have a peaceful night. Waking up in the middle of the night, he suddenly saw a disheveled girl squatting on the ground, tilting her head and staring straight at him. Startled, he sat up and the girl disappeared. Then he heard a woman's crying next to him. The cry was mournful and chilling, almost causing him to wet his pants. As the crying suddenly stopped, he turned his head. The girl appeared again, staring at him with a terrifying gaze. He woke up, realizing he had just had a nightmare. Hearing the commotion, Fun came downstairs. On told her he had seen a ghost. She asked him to calm down, explaining that she and the housemaid had lived there for over ten years without encountering any ghosts. However, still shaken, On made a hasty escape from Fun's home. But On still had fun on his mind. Besides, his buddies were eager to see Fun's charm. So On found himself back at Fun's house. But Fun wasn't home, and the housemaid welcomed On in, offering him their homemade pomegranate juice. The taste was still quite strange. Before long, Fun returned and was surprised to see On, thinking that he wouldn't visit her home again. Soon, their relationship quickly warmed up. On rested his head on Fun's lap. She asked him what he liked about her. After thinking for a moment, he said he liked her personality, cute and elegant. Fun then asked if he would continue to like her, no matter what happened. On nodded, and this time they finally shared a smelly kiss. The next morning, On awoke to the sound of Fun and the housemaid arguing. The housemaid scolded Fun for being immodest, but Fun retorted that it was her body and her decision. She went upstairs, insisting that On stay for lunch, and went to the market to buy groceries. 
At noon, On went downstairs, proudly calling his buddies to tell them he had succeeded and sent them a photo of him and Fun together. He accidentally turned on the TV, showing the news of a missing girl who looked exactly like Fun. Suddenly, a shadow flashed by. Gathering his courage, On followed and stepped on a photo. Bending down to pick it up, the red talisman on the door fell. The photo showed the housemaid with a girl whose face was blurred, seemingly rubbed off on purpose. Suddenly, the door moved on its own, and curiosity got the better of him. He opened the door and went inside. The room was small and dimly lit, with an altar and numerous bottles filled with liquid on both sides. The sound of the crying woman came again, and Aun followed the noise. As he was about to peek behind a curtain, a noise came from behind him, and a girl's figure appeared, startling him and causing him to stumble into the curtain. Looking up, he saw a head that looked like fun. Terrified, he tried to run, but was knocked unconscious. When Aun woke up, he found himself tied to a chair, his eyes covered with a cloth. He kept shouting to be released and asked what they wanted to do. The housemaid pulled out a knife, saying that she hoped they two could be together for a long time, but since he had discovered their secret, she couldn't let him go. With that, she smirked and held the knife to Aun's throat. Aun misunderstood the situation, thinking that the housemaid had killed Fun. Trembling, he asked her why she did it. Just then, Fun rushed in, and through their conversation, On learned that the housemaid was actually Fun's birth mother. In order to make her daughter prettier, she had kidnapped the missing girl, tortured her to death, and used witchcraft. Fun had submerged her face in the blood-soaked water with the girl's corpse, and any boy who drank the water would see illusions. The vision of Fun would show the dead girl's pretty appearance. The mother insisted on killing On, knowing that the truth was now out and that he would never love her ugly daughter. But Fun tried to stop her, and in the struggle, she killed her own mother. She wanted to run away with On, but once the cloth covering his eyes was removed, he saw Fun's true appearance. From On's shocked expression, Fun realized that he couldn't accept her terrible looks. She covered her face and wept in pain, asking him if he truly loved her. However, facing her ugly face, On couldn't love her no matter what. He begged Fun to let him go, promising not to say anything. But Fun, furious, picked up the knife and stabbed On. It turned out that the girl who had handed On the red drink on the basketball court was Fun herself, who intentionally caused him to see her illusions. The sixth story, titled Uninvited Line, begins with a high school student named Nay, who was about to face his college entrance exams. His mother wanted him to study medicine, but he was more interested in pursuing the arts. This caused a lot of tension between them. After a heated argument one day, Nay told his mother that he'd rather be with his deceased father than live with her, and he stormed out of the house. Nay went to his friend's house and called his mother, making her think he was going to take his own life. Feeling sorry for her son, she compromised and promised not to interfere with his choices anymore. She tearfully asked him to come home, but he hung up before she could finish. That evening, a group of boys gathered to play a prank. They took turns using Nay's friend's landline phone to call random numbers, harassing strangers for fun. Nay called a number, and an old lady on the other end thought her grandson was calling. Cruelly, Nay told her that her grandson would never come back. After hanging up, the boys laughed maliciously. Nay's mother then tried to call him, but he rejected her call. His friends thought he was being too harsh on his mother, but he didn't care. To spite her, Nay decided to stay the night at his friend's house. Late that night, while the two boys were sound asleep, the landline phone suddenly rang. Nay groggily answered it, only to find that it was his mother on the line. She said that Nay had just called her, crying and saying nothing. Impatient, he interrupted her, saying he'd been asleep and hadn't called her. He suspected that his friend was behind the call, but the friend didn't even have his mother's phone number. Something wasn't adding up. The next day, the friend decided to go back to his parents' house, leaving Nay alone and giving him the keys. As soon as the friend left, the phone rang again, but when Nay answered, all he heard was silence. He hung up, and it immediately rang again, still silent. Annoyed, he unplugged the phone line. That night, as Nay lay in bed reviewing his studies, he fell asleep and snoring like a pig. His mother's call woke him up. She asked him worriedly what was going on, as he had just called her again, crying and saying nothing. Nay was puzzled, saying he had unplugged the phone line. He looked at the bedside landline, realizing that the phone line had been plugged back in. This was too strange. So he set up a DV camera to record while he slept, intending to see who was playing tricks on him. 
The next day, he sent the video to his friend. There was nothing unusual, but his friend pointed out he stayed on his side the whole time, but it seemed like there was someone sleeping with him. Nay looked back at the bed in alarm, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. Just then, the landline rang again. He picked it up nervously, but there was only his echo and nothing else. As he was about to hang up, he realized the phone line hadn't been plugged in. A chilling laughter came through the phone, scaring him into dropping the receiver. One day, Nay gathered his friends for a get-together. They stared in disbelief as he made calls one by one to figure out who was the caller. This was completely unreliable, and they had an exam the next day. The friends soon left to review for their exams, and Nay, no longer daring to stay alone, packed up his books and returned home. As soon as he entered the house, his mother called him and told him to go to the rooftop. When Nay arrived at the rooftop, there was no one there. Suddenly, the door was slammed shut and locked from the outside. He shouted for his mother, but there was no response. His cell phone had been left downstairs, and in desperation, he considered climbing down from the rooftop. At that moment, his mother finally appeared, looking confused. Nay asked her why she had called him to the rooftop. His mother looked bewildered and didn't know what he was talking about. He tried to show her the call log on his phone, but the record had mysteriously disappeared. That night, as Nay studied in his room, his phone displayed an incoming call from his mother. He answered, but there was no sound on the other end. Instead, the wardrobe door opened on its own, followed by the electric fan starting up and the guitar making noise. It was as if something was approaching him. Terrified, he fled the room, pounding on his mother's door and shouting for her. The unknown entity seemed to follow him downstairs, getting closer and closer. Just in the nick of time, his mother opened her door. He decided to spend the night in her room, but then the landline phone by the bed rang. His mother answered, and again there was only an echo. Nay, frightened, grabbed the phone and hung up. In the middle of the night, half asleep, Nay asked his mother if she would blame herself if he had really ended his own life. His mother was silent for a long time before saying everything she had done was because she loved him. At that moment, they heard the sound of a toilet flushing. Nay's mother suddenly realized that the person speaking to her wasn't her son at all. The voice had come from the phone. Nay picked up the receiver and asked what it wanted. The eerie voice on the other end told him to guess. Then the call was disconnected. The next day, his mother, worried about her son's safety, insisted on accompanying him to his exam. They drove to the school's parking lot, and Nay handed her his exam schedule, turned off his phone, and asked her not to turn it on during his exam. After Nay entered the exam room, it wasn't long before a cell phone ringtone could be heard outside the classroom. Nay felt uneasy. He was about to stand up when his friend suddenly did. The friend thought it was his own phone ringing, but when he checked, it was indeed Nay's. Annoyed, he turned off the phone. After the first exam, the friend told Nay that his mother had called. Hearing this, Nay hurried to the parking lot, but his mother's car was gone. The caretaker said the car had just left. After pondering, Nay decided to call his mother, but the call couldn't get through. He became increasingly worried. His mother didn't return, and Nay had no choice but to go back to the exam room. As soon as he left, his mother returned. The caretaker said a boy had come looking for her and seemed anxious. Before entering the exam room, Nay finally received a call from his mother. However, after some thought, he hung up and turned off the phone before entering the exam room. At that moment, his mother's turned-off phone received a call from Nay. She hesitated, knowing he should be taking the exam and eventually hung up. While she was staring at the phone in fear, the caretaker suddenly knocked on her car window, saying a young boy urgently needed to speak with her. She reluctantly took the call, wondering who it was. At this point, Nay had lost all focus on his exam. He filled in the same answer choice for every question before hurriedly handing in his paper and leaving the exam room. He ran to the parking lot in one breath, but his mother's car was still gone. He went to the street and saw a traffic accident up ahead with a crowd of onlookers. His phone rang again and he froze in place, worried that his mother had been in an accident. Suddenly, his mother's voice came from behind him, calling his name. He sighed in relief as he saw her waving to him from across the street, carrying medication she had just bought. She asked if his stomach still hurt. Nay, puzzled, asked about the stomach ache, and his mother's expression immediately froze. She realized the previous call hadn't been from her son. Nay confirmed her suspicion when suddenly, a speeding car headed straight for Nay's mother. In the hospital, Nay wept uncontrollably, his upper body and hands covered in his mother's blood. Just then, the phone rang again. It was his mother, saying she wouldn't come back to find him and that he should take care of himself. Nay begged his mother not to leave him, but she replied that she was going to find his father because Nay said he didn't want to be with her. 
Nay suddenly realized the person on the phone wasn't his mother. He yelled for why the person was going after his mother. The call was disconnected. Enraged, Nay smashed his phone on the ground. As he screamed hysterically outside the emergency room, the doctor arrived, saying that his mother was safe. After being unconscious for two days, his mother finally woke up. The mysterious phone call never came again. Nay didn't attend subsequent exams, telling his mother that he was responsible for his own decision and decided not to take exams in this situation. His mother understood, saying that this is the longest she had slept since he was born. She hoped Nay would understand her love for him. The friend called, saying he had found the number Nay had dialed for the prank call. Nay tried calling and got through to the grandson, learning that both grandson and grandmother were fine. Relieved, Nay apologized to them for the inconvenience. The seventh story, titled Break the Rules at Night, begins with a high schooler, Nut, sneaking into the school but being caught red-handed by a fierce security guard. Nut quickly explained that he was going to find a club senior for an activity, but the guard said the event was already over. Nut begged him to let him in, but the guard was unmoved and pushed him out of the school gate. Just then, the guard's phone rang, and Nut noticed he was limping. Seizing the opportunity, Nut dashed into the school, leaving the helpless guard behind. There were many clubs in the school, and one of them was a crossword puzzle club organized by Nut's idol, the senior student Jay. However, compared to other clubs, their club had few visitors. As soon as Nut entered, he insisted on taking everyone to visit the dance club, where handsome men and beautiful women gathered, making it very popular. Jay, the club president, was naturally unhappy. Back in their room, he angrily pushed a chessboard to the ground, throwing a tantrum. Seeing this, everyone suggested helping him redecorate the room to attract more members. Just as they were about to start, the limping security guard appeared uninvited, ordering them to leave the school. Everyone tried to persuade him, but he remained heartless and even pushed a girl, Kem, to the ground. Jay and the guard got into an argument, but luckily Nut's brother, Nerd, stopped them. The guard turned off the classroom lights, and the other club members left the school. The guard locked the gate, but to support Jay, his friends stayed behind and decorated the club using the dim moonlight. Nerd told the girl Pi that his younger brother had always idolized Jay. Pi replied that she didn't think Jay was that great, and that she actually thought Nerd was better than him. She shyly lowered her head after speaking. They finished their task and headed to the school gate to go home, only to see the security guard polishing a sharp knife. He then began to drink by himself. Suddenly, the guard yelled and everyone quickly retreated. It turned out that two boys had missed the school leaving time because they were preparing for the club. The guard slapped them. The group was both shocked and scared. Jay suggested that they should all spend the night at the school. The school's swimming pool was closed for repairs, so perhaps the security guard wouldn't find them there. They made their way to the pool, despite the warning signs hanging outside the door stating that it was closed for repairs. These young people climbed over the fence and jumped in. The five of them splashed around in the pool and started talking about the security guard. Nerd shared why the guard despised students so much. It was because one day the limping guard caught a young couple secretly dating on campus. The students were frightened and tried to run away but were caught by the guard. During the struggle, the guard lost his footing on the stairs, fell, and broke his leg. Since then, he had viewed all students as enemies. Then, Jay climbed onto the metal frame by the poolside and started diving, unaware of the danger lurking nearby. At that moment, Nut went back inside the building alone to get something to drink. Then, as if guided by a mysterious force, Nut wandered into the control room to turn on the pool's spotlights. Meanwhile, Jay continued to flirt with the girls and dive from the metal frame. With each sway of the frame, the bolts securing it shook loose, and a cutting machine slowly moved towards the edge. Finally, the cutting machine fell, narrowly missing Kem. The group was shaken by the close call. Just as Nerd noticed his younger brother was missing, the security guard suddenly appeared. The four of them swam to the edge of the pool, grabbed their clothes, and ran. They sprinted away, leaving a trail of water behind them. Nerd carefully wiped away the nearby water, making it difficult for the limping guard to track them. Then, the four split up and hid in storage lockers. As they watched the guard approach, their hearts raced. Tragically, the guard discovered Kem and dragged her away. After the sound of footsteps disappeared, they came out but couldn't find Kem. The three of them grabbed flashlights and decided to head back to the pool to search for Kem and Nut, only to discover that the metal pipe had pierced the security guard's body. The limping guard was dead. Who was the guard they had just seen? The three were horrified, especially Pi, who just wanted to go home. The timid Jay brought a chair, wanting to leave the school as quickly as possible. 
Nerd asked Jay to take care of Pi since he planned to stay behind and continue looking for his brother Nut and Kem. Pi decided to stay as well and help him search for their missing friends. Although Jay was extremely reluctant, he had no choice but to follow them. They followed the trail of water to the outside of a classroom. As the limping guard's uneven footsteps approached, the three quickly crouched down and hid. The ghostly figure of the security guard appeared on the glass, but luckily they hid just in time. However, the guard's ghostly figure returned, but they had already changed hiding spots. Jay didn't want to stay any longer and told Nerd they should leave. He believed that Nerd's younger brother had either already left them behind and gone home or was dead. Nerd refused to believe his brother would abandon him, and they argued. After the dispute, Jay went his own way, while Nerd and Pi continued searching for their missing classmates in the school. Suddenly, a figure darted across a classroom downstairs. Although they were terrified, Nerd and Pi decided to go downstairs and investigate. Meanwhile, Jay heard the distant sound of a woman's cries. He slowly approached and saw a figure that appeared to be Kem. As he reached out to touch her shoulder, the ghostly guard suddenly appeared. Nerd and Pi were downstairs in the classroom, searching as the limping footsteps echoed again. They were caught in a struggle with the ghostly guard when they saw Kem and Jay with lifeless expressions, now ghosts themselves. They desperately fled to the restroom and overheard Nut sobbing and repeatedly apologizing for something. Huddled in the corner of the electrical room, Nut clasped his hands together, apologizing non-stop that he didn't mean to kill everyone. Nerd and Pi exchanged glances. At that moment, Nerd touched Pi's wet hair and finally understood. The cutting machine that had fallen was connected to electricity. The moment it fell, Nut happened to close the circuit breaker. Consequently, the four people in the pool were electrocuted instantly. By the time the security guard arrived, they were already dead. While trying to catch Nut, the limping guard accidentally kicked the unstable metal frame, causing the falling pipe to kill him. Although Nerd and Pi were reluctant to accept the truth, they forgave Nut and left the empty room, where only Nut remained, alone and repenting. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.